Heike Schüssler. I'm professor of organization science at Johannes Kepler University Linz and with me is Dr. Jan Pospisil. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Vienna and an expert on conflict and peace studies. Um, he's also research director of the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Research in Schleining and uh, he has a lot of research but also a lot of practical experience in peace building, peacekeeping, um, especially in the wider horn of Africa. So thank you for being here, Jan, and thank you for having me. Sharing some of your knowledge and expertise. So the reason why um, I asked you to do this brief interview with me for our students, students of, of this course, is especially because we are um, management and organization scholars and students. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about um, organizing in times of war and armed conflict, um, I think the expertise of political science and international relations research is extremely important. So um, we would, or I would, on behalf of my colleagues, <laughs> like to talk with you a little bit about sort of core concepts when it comes to peacekeeping, peace um, building and peace making. And maybe mm -hmm. we can start with that. Can you explain us the difference between these concepts? Okay, yeah. I mean, it goes back uh, quite a bit now, the difference between these three concepts, peacekeeping, peace building, peacemaking. Peacekeeping has obviously the longest history, has, is an endeavor mainly um, um, driven by the UN, goes back to the 50s, 60s even. And it's usually um, an endeavor, military endeavor, um, which is mandated by the UN Security Council. Um, so it needs um, um, the approval of all WTO countries and the majority of the, of the Security Council. There is a mandate which is usually time bound, one year, half a year. Um, and the concept of peacekeeping is also part of the UN Charter. So it's mm -hmm. essential kind of an essential task of what the United Nations do. There's even two, two, two versions of, of, of peacekeeping. Traditionally, Chapter 6 mandates would be without um, approval to use mm -hmm. offensive armed violence. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, most peacekeeping missions, if not all now, can't remember exactly, are not Chapter 7 man, uh, missions. And Chapter 7 missions are entitled to use um, armed force mm -hmm. also in not non-defense situations. Mm -hmm. So this is the very, but it's a very clear thing, UN mission mm -hmm. mandated by the Security Council, time-bound, very clear mandate, these days mainly focused on protection of mm -hmm. civilians and safeguarding peace and transition processes. Peacemaking, uh, in turn, is a more political endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, it's about initiating and facilitating negotiations between conflict parties to come to things like ceasefire agreements or peace agreements, and then basically driving a process into, into a formal transition mm -hmm. after war. So this is peacemaking is in a sense the, mm -hmm. the, the, the effort of getting negotiations going. Mm -hmm. um, peace building, um, finally, it's, it's not so easy to define since this is really a broad term mm -hmm. encompassing basically everything that goes on, on several levels into the support of, mm -hmm. of what is now they called positive peace in in a conflict region it's, it, it, and it starts from supportive measures to peacekeeping to peacemaking to it would would um encompass track one five track two so civil society peace mm -hmm. negotiations but it would go far to confidence mm -hmm. building measures between regions between even villages mm -hmm. Transitional justice. So it's a broad, so it's the broad broadest field. term yeah. of the three. Yeah, if I understand correctly. Okay, that's already very useful. Thank you. I think organizational <laughs> management scholars use these terms kind of exchangeably. Um, so you've already mentioned some core organizations that we need for peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building. Uh, the UN. You have mentioned the UN. You have mentioned civil society. You've mentioned political negotiation, so I think we need nation states there, diplomats. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the core organizational actors, but also the core kind of institutions we need for mm -hmm. for peace in all three, in I mean, all three variants? That's a really interesting question, because here I think that the, the landscape is, is changing in, in recent years in several aspects. 
because usually, especially like in, in terms of peacemaking, it would come down to a few like neutral countries who would kind of, without any obvious self-interest, um, try to facilitate negotiations. Like Norway, mm -hmm. the Norway, Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, mm -hmm. perhaps even Austria, Austria historically of, of, of these world of the of the world. But um, in, in in several aspects, this has this has changed. What comes now in in bilateral mediation is more and more a turn to like interested mediation. Mm -hmm. I would call it. We have it. We had it already in Syria. We had it in in the Philippines with Malaysia very strongly. And now, if you look at Ukraine with Turkey in there as perhaps the most credible mediator, it's now countries that more and more come into this role who have substantial interest in this conflict. Mm -hmm. And this is a shift at the mm -hmm. international level that you can see. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have mm -hmm. you have also international organizations playing a role here. The credo given out by the United Nations some years ago was that they want to transfer their almost like monopoly um, and um, down to more regional organizations. So you have a stronger role of regional organizations in these mitigation processes. Like this, what? Like regional this, NGOs? No, no, like regional organizations like in, in, in um, East Africa, it would be EGOT, International Government, uh, Intergovernment, Mm -hmm. so authority on development, mm -hmm. gotta get it out. In West Africa it would be ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. It works in some regions better than in others. Mm -hmm. in, in Southeast Asia, for example, it would be ASEAN. Mm -hmm. But ASEAN has traditionally the issue that their state sovereignty is a very high kind of mm -hmm. good, um, to say it like that. Mm -hmm. And there, there's not so much room for international organizations to maneuver, mm -hmm. which is a bit different in, in part of Africa, for instance. Mm -hmm. So the, the role of these regional organizations, also African Union, for instance, gets stronger in these, mm -hmm. in these mediations. UN is still present. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have um, often um, groups of guarantors, which are states. Um, there was one instance in the Philippines where these this group would encompass civil society as well. Um, in Sudan, for instance, in South Sudan, the same, you have a so-called Troika, mm -hmm. which uh, is the US, UK and Norway. Mm -hmm. And now you, there's in, increasingly gatherings in, in, in quite a few peace processes of so-called groups of friends and, mm -hmm. and these kinds of settings, which uh, involves more bilateral actors from different mm -hmm. kinds of strands. Who kind of observe, mm -hmm. accompany mm -hmm. these kinds of processes, mm -hmm. and then of course there is private mediation mm -hmm. um, becoming a bigger field. Though you have to say not so much on a national level, but more in local and subnational peace and mediation, which private, is by uh, private actors. Yeah, the private actors. Companies. So the biggest ones are are HD Center, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and Conflict Management Initiative in. Finland, these are two so consulting companies. Or... It's not really consulting; they're really mm -hmm. mediation, mediation um, mm -hmm. NGOs in a sense. Mm -hmm. So they would they have like lots of money. Mm -hmm. They would usually what they do is not getting getting publicly known, but it would come would drink lots of coffee with mm -hmm. local craftsmen and stuff, and get mm -hmm. get try to get local peace agreements, local peace mm -hmm. arrangements to work. Sounds like a very messy. It is a messy, messy space. What is very interesting in that regard that humanitarian actors who have traditionally never touched this because it was too political and not mm -hmm. really humanitarian principles become important here. Mm -hmm. Mainly the World Food Program has mm -hmm. played a significant role in Syria, mm -hmm. also in Sudan and other places of, of engaging mm -hmm. in peace negotiations, mm -hmm. um, mainly for their excess mm -hmm. of like humanitarian aid. But it stretches a bit beyond that, so they become an actor in this field. A political actor. Yeah. yeah. Well, because the problem areas overlap, right? Yeah. Of course, war comes with hunger and famine, comes exactly. with yeah. medical issues yeah. and so on. I mean, it's still a huge contestation, though, yeah. if they should do that or not. Yeah. Um, there is quite a lot of discussion around that. What do you think? Internationally. Well, it depends. I mean, it's, in, 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 in theory, you would say, are they really equipped to do that? Mm. Should they? engage. Um, my experience with the food program, my experiences in the country where I am, are rather good, I have to say. There's very capable people mm -hmm. who are on the ground a lot, who have a lot of local knowledge that hardly anybody else has. I mean, you have to take into account they run like 
in, in most of these countries, they, the World Food Programme runs huge logistical operations. Mm. They are the main logistics yes. provider. They run the United Nations Air Humanitarian Air Service. They have all the planes. Everybody travels with WFP, which yeah. gives them like a, a very strong role. Mm. Um, I mean, it's kind of, as I say, my experience is rather positive, but I wouldn't say necessarily that it is the right way to go. I, I'm not sure if it's their role for the for the upcoming future, mm -hmm. but they can make a useful can, difference in mm, some some context. Depends on the context. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. So, are there any, um, given that it's such a messy field, are there still any kind of institutional templates these actors can draw on, or does it all need to be kind of negotiated and arranged from scratch? Scratch. I mean, usually you'd always see that. There is a strong role if there's a UN mission there. Mm -hmm. um, they play a considerable role. If there's a special representative of the Secretary General, this person has a considerable role to play. Mm -hmm. um, so it's either with this person or against this person, but this person would never be irrelevant mm -hmm. as such. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's also like a, a SRSGs are nominated by the Security Council, so there is a strong mm -hmm. international process behind that. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, it's really an, an, an increasingly open debate who should mediate. I mean, we look at Ukraine, we see that like suggestions come from all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, again, it wouldn't be necessarily Switzerland or these, mm -hmm. it's, it might be China. China, China was called upon. Yeah. Turkey is very active. Israel should play a role and whatever. So it's interesting mm -hmm. that, and this is permanently part of the negotiation, mm -hmm. who would be credible mediators who could do something in this. So it is in, like structurally institutionally not so much there. What is there though is, and I have to say I've been involved, I'm still involved in a program that collects peace agreements. So we have a huge database of basically mm -hmm. all signed national wow. level peace agreements since 1990. And peace agreements look like over the years even quite similar. Mm -hmm. So you have several mm -hmm. like, like almost blocks of knowledge or like containers of, of, of kind of mm. stipulations that are used almost mm. interchangeably across contexts. So in terms of the topics and kind of the thematic expertise, there is actually a lot to draw on, not necessarily positive because some of them just are more used as templates that are not necessarily working mm. in a particular context, but there is lots of knowledge there and it is copied and used. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of process professionalization yeah. and standardization yeah, yeah. going on. You have also like in, in, in any proper peace process when it comes down to the real agreement, usually there's a US law firm mm -hmm. doing this as pro bono, mm -hmm. CSR stuff, and they come and mm -hmm. bring proper contract lawyers. Mm -hmm. They draw, of course, on the resources yeah. that are available. You have something like a union mediation team. So there's a mediation support unit within the United Nations. They provide them mm -hmm. Another experience, and these are the same people everywhere, more or less. So, in, in that's why this looks all in many cases quite similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we've talked a bit about the formal kind of organizations, actors, and institutions. But I guess what happens in conflict is, and what we also see now in Ukraine, is that there's a huge disruption in the whole formal and organizational infrastructure. So, can you tell us a little bit about the sort of informal underbelly of, of those? peace missions. Yeah. I mean, Ukraine might be particular in so far as there has been a kind of credible and tangible set of formal institutions in place. I mean, in other countries like Yemen or, or South Sudan, even other Central African Republic, you would be hard pressed to say that we had like a formal functional state mm -hmm. ever there. Mm -hmm. um, probably not. We, we use in increasingly now a notion of a fragment state, not fragmented, which means it was there and broke, but more like a state that only appears in fragments. Mm -hmm. You see mm -hmm. certain elements, but it's sometimes just also not there. Mm -hmm. So there's hardly, and this is a bit the, 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 this juncture here that especially UN missions, also UN institutions and the country team, also bilateral actors, they kind of have to rely on national state counterparts. And they are formally there, but they are in no way um, representing mm -hmm. the real relevant mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. institutional setting, mm -hmm. or we would call it political settlement, that is in place in such a mm -hmm. such a setting. It's not, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. And this is the issue because they have to work with ministries who are in a way relevant or not relevant, but not relevant in the sense that the education ministry is not important because of education. It is the person. Why is this minister minister? Yeah. 
And this person is not minister because education expert or kind of, it's, it's the same everywhere, it's political negotiation, but here it becomes even more important why a person is sitting in a, in a certain kind of setting. And what is this role in a wider political kind of contestation within the country? And here there is a huge challenge, especially for international actors who are not so used to these settings to work with this. Because it's, it's usually they're not so well equipped mm -hmm. because they need sure. the formal yes, counterparts. They, they don't have the legitimacy necessarily and the resources. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, in organization theory, we usually take the state for granted as an actor, um, which is increasingly problematic. I think also in other non-conflict contexts. Yeah. And I guess that would be another example where, where this really matters. Um, thank you. So, um, we said we want to keep this short and crisp, kind of a basic, <laughs> basic introduction. So can you summarize um, to, to students of management studies, organization studies who have no background in this, maybe a little bit of knowledge of, of institutions and governance, basic governance concepts. What are the key things you think they need to understand about peacekeeping? Yeah, peace I mean, building, peace especially um, which, which came to me when I spent a lot of time there during COVID, the interesting thing is the different temporalities things go. Mm -hmm. I was in a, in a setting with the main opposition group in South Sudan and they did their negotiations in the place where I was staying. Mm -hmm. I came to them and they were negotiating and said, oh, whoa, whoa, you're negotiating. When, when you're finished, and like when we are finished. So there was no kind of deadline. deadline. There would be something like, okay, it takes the time it takes. We are not on a, on a time scale necessarily. Mm -hmm. And this is, especially in a transition process where you have formal deadlines and like 45 mm -hmm. days, then it's this, and two months is this. It, this kind of is not really going mm -hmm. together. It's not synchronized. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important element here is to see that informal institutions do not work on timelines and these expectations. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of, of, of kind of non-solutions, not doing things, waiting out. Um, a colleague of mine, Alex Seval, has for, for Sudan developed this interesting term of fragility, which means an ability mm -hmm. to basically outweigh another person. Mm -hmm. Just being more like waiting is, a, is well, an yeah. amazing strategic yes. capability. Yeah. So it's kind of waiting longer than mm -hmm. the other and kind of having more stamina, basically. Yeah. 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 So these, these mm -hmm. things are, I think, important to understand that, yeah, there are institutions. You don't get necessarily from the first glance how to work because who's formal in charge is not necessarily in charge. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. other kind of mechanisms mm -hmm. that might be play. There are like families, there's lots of, 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 mm -hmm. of elements to consider and the temporalities work differently. This is very, very important to understand. That's very interesting. We actually have a session on the temporalities oh. of warfare. So <laughs> it's a topic that organization scholars are also increasingly interested in. So that's, yeah. that's really uh, um, useful to hear. Great. Well, and I mean, the final question, maybe, um, because you mentioned that uh, what you said now is not necessarily doesn't necessarily hold for Ukraine, but more for country, countries and contexts where statehood is really very weak already from the start. Mm -hmm. um, so can you give us some reflections on um, on the Ukraine situation? So who who would be the core actors who could be tasked with keep peacekeeping there and also the role of Russia is actually a core member of the existing international agreements and organizations. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's, it's very fresh and difficult to, to predict. It seems since, as you, as you say, Russia is part of Security Council and one of the powers. So if there is a peacekeeping mission coming, it wouldn't necessarily not against being against Russia's interests. Mm -hmm. And I also have to say, I don't regard it as in any way realistic to strip Russia of the powers to basically be the end of the UN as we know it. So uh, probably not the most useful approach to take. Ukraine historically um, has been as the whole kind of post-Soviet kind of region, mm -hmm. uh, the responsibility of the OSC, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is an organization which comes out of um, these negotiations between the Americans and the, and the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. The problem is, though, that, of course, given this high political setting mm -hmm. they are situated in, that they don't have much power basically to do anything. Mm -hmm. So there is a high likelihood that these things go into what is there in the region quite common, what we call frozen conflict, 
that has always the risk, of course, of picking up again, mm -hmm. popping up again and becoming another problem. But I mean, I'm afraid to say I can't see many other opportunities. I mean, you have to be realistic, even like a frozen conflict might be better than a hot conflict. And yeah. you have to always see what is realistic kind yeah. of goals in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for this brief but super interesting introduction into the business of peace.